Hello, hi, welcome back to our latest chapter in Southampton Reviews in Cardiothoracic Surgery. In this chapter, we'll be discussing cardiac anatomy. And uh, before we start, I would like to thank our supervisors for this chapter, Mr. Sonil Ori, our clinical lead and lead for education, uh, Mr. Zabi Muskolchi, our other cardiac surgery consultant, as well as Mr. Subhati Shlusra, our senior surgical fellow. Before we start, uh, this is a mind map, a table of contents of what we will be discussing in this chapter. Please send, spend a few seconds, familiarize yourself with what we will be discussing. It helps to gain the information um, uh, in a more persistent manner. Now the surface anatomy, so draw and imagine a line in the midline and then two other lines in the second space fixed into coastal space. If you draw a point at the lower limit of the second space, upper limit, again in the fifth space, lower limit, upper limit, you are drawing the four pillars of the cardiac shadow. What's remaining is understanding how far from the midline these points are. So um, it's a variable distance. Generally speaking, the three uh, nearest points are parasternal, and the furthest point is around six to nine centimeters away from the midline. But um, in a more accurate manner, the distance between the uh, clear and nearer points in the midline is if denoted by x, then the uh, further point is denoted by uh, double x. Um, this concludes the peri uh, surface anatomy. Now let's go to the pericardium. So initially speaking, the layers of pericardium are in continuity, as you can see here. Then what happens is the heart starts to push or invaginate uh, these two layers, bringing them um, uh, together. These are the two uh, serous pericardium layers. That is, the one in red is uh, the uh, visceral pericardium. The one in green is the parietal pericardium. The visceral pericardium is further into the heart. The uh, um, parietal pericardium is further away. Then we have a third layer which develops. That is the fibrous pericardium, which uh, encompasses all of these um, layers together. So the pericardium is consistent of three layers. Two layers uh, for serous, visceral, and parietal, and then one layer outside is the uh, fibrous pericardium. Because the heart is not a uniform sp a sphere, it does not push the pericardium equally in all directions, and it creates what we call recesses or, trans uh, or sinuses. Um, the first uh, recess or sinus, as you can see here, is the transverse sinus. That is the transverse space between the arterial and the venous end of the heart tube. So in front is the arterial end, the arterial trunk, that is the aorta and pulmonary artery. Behind is the um, venous end, that is the atria and the cava. This is the transverse sinus. The oblique sinus is the space traveling all the way up from the apex upwards, ending at the uh, uh, reflection of the pulmonary veins. Now, um, a point here of significance is the uh, uh, transverse sinus. It is of surgical significance. So, for instance, this is the space where the surgeons could pass the right internal mammary artery from the right side to the left side, all the way down. Um, why is this important? Because it protects the mammary from traveling in front of the heart and being subject or at risk of being cut and during a reduced sternotomy. So, passing it through this space protects it. Also, the transverse sinus is a space where the surgeons could access the pulmonary artery branches and perform pulmonary arterioplasty. Also, it's a space where surgeons in transposition of great arteries can perform the Lecomte maneuver. Um, various importance. Also, in trauma situations, for instance, this is where the surgeon can um, uh, quickly access and stop bleeding by uh, having control of the arterial end of the heart, hence pinching the arterial output of the heart and stopping bleeding uh, rapidly through a thoracotomy, for instance, and uh, various importance of these uh, sinuses. Next is the coronary system. I'll use this model to demonstrate. So as you can see here, as we all know, there are two uh, main coronary arteries or branches or systems coming out. So the first is the, coron uh, the right coronary artery em uh, emerging from the um, right coronary sinus traveling through the interventricular, atrioventricular groove all the way back to um, end at the um, PDA, posterior descending artery, and the PLV branch, that is the posterior left ventricular branch. Along the way, several uh, branches emerge, including the coronal artery, traveling in front of the uh, artery OT or the conus, um, the sinoatrial artery traveling to the sinoatrial node, and the uh, acute marginals, AV nodal arteries, and the two terminal branches. It is of importance to understand why are the acute marginals referred to as acute. Um, I understand we all know there are obtuse marginals on this side, and those on this side are referred to as acute marginals. Why is that? If you draw an imaginary line through the apex, as you can see here, the arteries traveling at this side, the right side, um, um, uh, form an acute angle. 
However, on the left side, imaginary line, as you can see, the arteries traveling here create an obtuse angle. Hence, acute marginals and obtuse marginals on this um, uh, side. Now, going to the left coronary system, starting with the left main uh, stem, uh, it originates in the left coronary sinus. Unfortunately, I cannot demonstrate this in here. Travels behind the pulmonary artery, emerges. Uh, right um, underneath the left atrial appendage then divides into two, the two main arteries that is the left anterior descending artery as you can see here and the other branch is the circumflex artery which travels all the way back to a valuable distance um, behind the heart the LED um, gives uh, two sets of branches that is the uh, diagonal arteries which emerge in the lateral side as well as the septal arteries whereas the circumflex gives of the obtuse marginals and we explained why they are referred to as obtuse marginals now a point of uh, confusion sometimes um, we all suffered that before is how to divide the led the led is divided into three main parts proximal mid and distal so the the uh, the divisions are relying on the first septal artery and diagonal so the proximal uh, division is from the origin to the um, first septal artery then the middle segment from the first septal to the last diagonal and then the terminal segment is from the last diagonal to termination we all came to a point when we got confused whether it's first septal first diagonal we all get confused with that let me tell you this piece of historic information it might help you to recall it more easily so historically speaking anatomists used to divide the led using the diagonal arteries and this is because simply that's what they see on the surface it's easily uh, vis um, uh, visualized so hence they use that with the advance of uh, coronary angiography radiologists interventional cardiologists surgeons started to appreciate the value and significance of the first septal artery for instance surgeons are adamant during coronary artery bypass grafting to make sure that the first septal artery receives a good uh, revascularization. Why is that? It um, revascularizing the septum, it uh, improves the quality of the uh, ventricular blood supply. It's a very important and a cardinal point of recovery of the ventricular function. Also, cardiologists are very um, keen about the first septal artery and how well is the anatomy of it simply because it's the first bifurcation it's the first point of obstruction they get it is the most liable first bifurcations are the points of liability to atherosclerosis and at risk of atherosclerosis it's the first bifurcation so they are very keen about that hence cardiologists surgeons interventional radiologists everyone started to appreciate the fact the importance of first septal artery and hence it, it only made sense to divide the LED using this uh, point. This is just to help you how to recall this um, uh, piece of information. Now, going to more interesting stuff, that is the variations. So, um, the sinoatrial node could arise from the right side in 54% of the cases, and 45% uh, um, uh, of the cases from the right side, 45% uh, uh, from the left side. Even nodal artery, again, uh, and then the PDA. PDA here, the side which produces the PDA or gives out the PDA is referred to as a dominant. So in 90% of the cases, uh, patients are right uh, dominant, that is the PDA originating from the right side. Less than 10% of the time, it originates from the left side and the remaining percentage is co-dominant. That means the PDA arises from both sides. Another important variation is understanding that the sinoatrial node artery could arise, as you can see here, a bit distal uh, from the origin. Why is that important? Because sometimes it becomes confusing in angio if you see this artery traveling all the way from right to left or left to right. Uh, understanding or appreciating this variation will explain it to you and make it more clear. Then you have the variation of the course of the sinoatrial node artery. It could travel in front of the cava, the superior vena cava, referred to a pre cava or behind that is post cable or both directions that is peri -cable. why is that important one of the established uh, uh, pathways or the uh, routes to the left atrium incisions of the left atrium is referred to as the superior septal route so surgeon starts the incision somewhere around here goes all the way up behind and ends up in the roof of the left atrium so the incision travels this way of course, traveling, doing the incision this way uh, puts the sinoatrial node artery at risk. Um, however, 
this is still an established um, course and incision to the left atrium, despite the fact that the sinoatrial node artery is at risk. Why is that? Theoretically speaking, the patient should suffer sinoatrial node dysfunction. However, technically speaking, not all patients suffer that even after uh, injury to the sinoatrial node artery simply because it's not a true end artery. The sinoatrial node does receive blood from different sources. It's a very good, uh, um, it gives a very good view of the um, uh, mitral valve, hence it's still used uh, route despite the risk of injury to SA nodal artery. Next is the coronary uh, venous system. So to start with the coronary sinus, as you can see here, the coronary sinus is the main venous channel sitting at the back of the heart at the atrioventricular groove. It receives several tributaries. The um, biggest tributary from the left side is the greater cardiac vein, as you can see here. And then there is the lesser cardiac vein from the right side, as you can see here. And then you have the middle cardiac vein here. So the greater cardiac vein accompanies the left anterior descending artery, as you can see. The lesser cardiac vein accompanies the acute marginals. The middle cardiac vein accompanies the PDA, posterior descending artery. There is also the left atrial vein of Marshall. Unfortunately, it's not demonstrated here, but it travels somewhere around the left atrium. Also, a few points of significance, surgical significance here. As you can see, the channel which drains the right side is the lesser cardiac vein. It's a small uh, vein. Hence, this explains why retrograde cardioplegia is not as effective in protecting the right side as the left side. Remember, the greater cardiac vein is the drainage of the left side. The lesser cardiac vein is from the right side. Hence, retrograde cardioplegia alone, without concomitant anti-grade cardioplegia, is considered suboptimal in protecting the right ventricle. Also, one other reason for that is the, the lesser cardiac vein originates very close to the ostium of the uh, um, coronary sinus. Hence, this explains why if the cannula pushes in forward a little bit deeper, it risks uh, blocking the ostium of the lesser cardiac vein. This explains also why there is an alternative way to, to give retrograde cardioplegia without putting a cannula in, that is the right atrial cardioplegia, in which the surgeon uh, clamps the SVC, IVC, pulmonary artery temporarily and then gives cardioplegia into the right atrium, pressurizes the right atrium, and um, uh, then the solution flows into the coronary sinus without risking blocking the origin of the lesser cardiac vein. Also, one point of uh, important significance here is how, you, as you can see here, the, the proximity of the coronary sinus to the surface of the right ventricle. So it's sometimes used as an alternative route to put the uh, um, ventricular leads um, instead of passing through the tricuspid valve, risking injury to the tricuspid valve or even frustrating the valve and causing uh, tricuspid regurg. Uh, um, cardiologists put the lead through the coronary sinus. As you can see, it's very close to the inferior surface of the heart and hence will be able to pace the uh, uh, right ventricle. Uh, these are the important points in the anatomy, coronary system and pericardium surface anatomy. I hope you enjoyed this and I will leave you now with this uh, MCQ question and uh, hope to meet in the next chapter. Thank you very much.